Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I am Deepa Karnadurka. I'm a developer. I worked on network technologies for um, over 10 years. Uh, Co-presenting with me today is Ramya Bola. Uh, she is also a developer. Uh, she works at uh, VMware uh, as a um, uh, software programmer, and I work at Ericsson. Uh, OF Connect is a library that is open sourced by CodeChix, which is a nonprofit organization, um, mostly run by volunteering engineers. And our core focus is to provide opportunities for technical growth for women in engineering. Uh, Ramya and I uh, have been in the core team of uh, contributors for this project, and we're very, very happy to present it to you today. So once I go over what OF Connect is and what it does, uh, we will discuss, um, we'll go quite deep into the design, uh, show you some code, um, and then the other aspects that came together as part of this project, uh, the first being the unit test automation. Uh, the second is how we integrated our uh, library into a real-world controller to prototype it as proof of concept uh, to show that it works. And uh, finally, the SGN setup that came together for our testing, uh, it's a small, minimal setup, but uh, we'll show you what we have used. And if we have some time, we will also demo. Um, and if anybody is interested in joining us, we are still in development phase. If anybody wants to join in, contribute, we'll, we'll have some pointers on how to get started. Um, everyone must be familiar with this, uh, but I still, for completeness, I want to go over a quick introduction of um, software-defined networking. A key concept here is uh, the separation between the control plane and the forwarding plane. Uh, this is the control layer right here, which is uh, implemented usually in an STN controller, and the forwarding plane is, um, is essentially a network of uh, switches. Uh, open flow is uh, the predominant uh, and an early SDN protocol that achieves um, SDN. And our core focus um, is also of open flow, uh, but even more so, our focus is on the communication aspects of um, uh, open flow, which is uh, which is defined as a channel spec within the open flow uh, protocol, and that's what defines how a, a controller and a switch will talk to each other. So uh, here I will give you some details on um, you know, what, what the problem we really saw was. Uh, we have a controller and a switch talking open flow uh, channels. And we saw several implementations of it. And uh, some problems, some glaring problems that came through where every open source um, implementation had its own source code for achieving this communication. So we saw a lot of duplication even in the open source universe. Uh, the second issue we noticed was a very high coupling between the communication, um, the low-level communication um, handling, and the rest of the open flow implementation. So that, in, that you know, directly leads into problems like you know, how do you handle multiversion every time an open flow uh, spec comes out? We have. Excuse me. We have a new transport protocols. We have uh, we have to make sure there's a version matching between the two sides and so on. So uh, it it gets a little harder when the code is so highly coupled and not modular enough that um, uh, this, you know maintaining it over a period of time gets very difficult. So our solution to this was to abstract out all the communication, the channel aspects of it into its own library, uh, and that's the blue box that you see on the slide. And uh, some other things that we thought were cool was to have this library support both the controller and the switch, so it could be used on either side of the communication channel. Uh, package it into a shared library that can that can be very easily compiled in, and finally, um, you know, publish it as a free software. So this leads us to the set of requirements that we placed on our um, uh, library. <clears throat> the very first thing is to hide all kinds of wire protocol details, uh, low-level socket, socket uh, calls, and um, all of that. The second is to manage OF connections to the channel setup as much as possible. We have had a good start. Uh, right now, our library recognizes the open flow identifiers for every channel. And uh, in the next phase, excuse me.
sorry. In the next phase, we intend to um, include a lot more of the channel set up as part of the library uh, itself and um, health monitoring of the connection and so on. So we really want this library to be um, uh, very suited to open flow. Uh, some, other, uh, <clears throat> uh, some other requirements that we placed on this was multi-language bindings. Uh, so, although this library can be used either on the controller or the switch, for the purpose of this talk, I will stick to um, the controller, um, also because that's where we have done most of our testing. So, multi-language comes in much more strongly on the controller world because we have uh, three predominant languages uh, that are used for the controllers, which is C, Java, and Python. Uh, we have implemented this library in C, and we have provided uh, bindings in Java and Python, so that's, that's covered. Uh, the next is the platform independence. I think this is, this is a, a big open uh, area, and we have made some strides by using the glib library, which provides um, platform independent system calls. <coughs> we can do a lot more, um, so it's work in progress, but we have, had, we have done a good start on this, and we have compiled it on different platforms. I'll be talking about uh, some of our uh, design goals for, the, for this project. One of our main design goals was to you know, handle performance under scale, to handle 256K simultaneous connections. And we also wanted our library to be capable of supporting multiple transport protocols that OpenFlow supports, like TCP, UDP, TLS, etc. The library should also be capable of adding new transport pro protocols as and when OpenFlow supports them. Another goal for us was to provide a common API so that we can integrate our library with both a controller or a switch as well. So the problem that we wanted to tackle in our design is uh, best described by this use case here. A controller which is connected to a switch has one main OpenFlow channel which is the data path channel. It has a DPID of 1 and aux ID of 0. And a controller can also have up to 256 auxiliary channels with a switch. And each of these channels are identified by the same DPID but different aux IDs. So on the whole, we, we can have up to 256K channels between a controller and a switch. And typically, a controller can support up to 1,000 switches, which is normal in the real world today. So that's where we get our scaling number from, which is 256K simultaneous connections. And that's why scalability is an important design goal for our project. So this is a block diagram uh, representing the various components we have in our library. As Deepa has mentioned, a controller or a switch can be written in multiple languages like C, Java, or Python. Since we have our API written in C, we have a small layer of SWIG bindings that export our API in Java and Python. Apart from that, we have three main components, which is the OF Connect API layer itself. And the net services is, is the uh, component responsible for encapsulating the transport protocols. And the elastic pool of threads is, is the component we have built to address the scalability issue. I'll be talking about uh, our API next. This is not an exhaustive set of API we have, but some of the important functions are listed here. We have some functions that we use for the initialization, and some functions which are used to handle the channels itself. And the, re the third block represents the functions that are needed to actually send and receive OpenFlow messages. One of the goals, as I had mentioned earlier, was to design a common API for both switch and controller, right? So we actually uh, have a libinit function wherein a controller or a switch can register itself with the library as a switch or a controller, and it can provide the IP address and the L4 port on which it is running using the dev register function. And the channel functions, the create channel and destroy channel, are the ones which are used to uh, you know, create new open flow channels or destroy them. Uh, the ones below, the accept and delete channels, 
are the callbacks that any controller needs to implement in order, uh, in order for us to notify it as and when we get new open flow channels or the channels get deleted. So this is a, a sequence diagram that uh, depicts the OF channel setup process. As you can see here, a controller initializes the library and registers itself with the library. Once that is done, the controller doesn't have to worry about the underlying socket function calls. So library is actually hiding it from the controller. And once the socket connections are taken care of, the open flow channel is set up. This is the stage when the controller and the switch begin to exchange the open flow messages like hello messages and echo messages and you know other things like features request, feature reply. So eventually we plan to handle these messages in the library itself and thus take out, uh, uh, thus the burden on the controller will be reduced further. So once this open flow channel is set up, that's when the controller and the switch can actually exchange uh, messages using our send and receive packet APIs. Uh, this is a set of logs uh, we, we, we show when during the open flow ch uh, channel setup process. A controller uh, initializes the library and then it registers itself with a particular IP address and L4 uh, port tuple. And during the registration process, a controller has also has to provide the callback functions that it, it has implemented. As you can see here, uh, once a new open flow channel is received, we notify the controller using the callback it has provided that a new open flow channel is ready to be accepted. And as you can see, we have uh, integrated our library with a mule controller. and. Uh, We've tested it out with, with, with the mule controller. This is the next component in our library, the net services component, which is responsible for encapsulating the transport protocols. So our main um, idea behind designing this component was to provide a generic framework so that you can support simultaneous multiple protocols and also to be able to add new protocols as and when necessary. So we've provided this net services uh, data structure with a bunch of callbacks. So an example on the right is for TCP. So if you want to add TCP support in your library, then you need to implement all these set of callbacks and uh, define them. So similarly, uh, we can add any, any new protocol uh, later on. I'll, I'll give you a simple example of how this can be done. These are the basic three steps that need to be done in order to add any new L4 protocol. You need to enumerate the new protocol, and then we need to define the net services callback functions for that particular protocol. And we also need to define the poll in and poll out callback functions that are responsible for handling the open flow messages as and when they come in or go out. The, these are some set of logs for our uh, net services component. So as and when a, new, a switch initiates a new connection with our library, that's where the, uh, the callback for our listenFT will be called. And this, this callback will in turn trigger the TCP accept function, which will create a new FD and add it in our Poland thread manager. So from, from this time, uh, the, the, the new FD is ready to receive and transmit new packets. And every time there is a poll-in on this new FD, we call the callback poll-in function that, that handles that message. And every time we need to transmit a message, uh, open flow message out of this FD, we call the poll-out callback function that the protocol has given us. So the elastic pool is at the very heart of the infrastructure that we have built. And um, if you ask us one good reason why you should use this library versus another, um, I would say this is it. Uh, because there were two key factors. One is um, this is a, basically a pool of threads that we're managing. But we're managing it in such a way that we can um, have 
up as low as one socket FD or as high as scaled up to 256K without over-provisioning or under-provisioning the, uh, uh, the resources. And the second aspect is that um, to be really aware of the you know, a difference here between SGN channels versus um, web server kind of connections in that once you set up a, a, ca a channel between a server and a, uh, a server which is a controller and a switch, it is quite permanent. It doesn't, it's not too much a flux. So you don't expect it to go down, uh, you know, it, you don't expect it to go up and down too frequently. So keeping that in mind, what we have designed here is instead of having a pool of threads that are waiting to be uh, load balanced and round, in a round robin fashion, uh, what we have done is to have as few threads as possible and maximize the utilization of the capacity of each of those threads that we already have. So until our first thread is really filled to capacity, we are not um, you know, provisioning resources to the next thread. I'll go a little more into how, um, it's a very simple algorithm, but I'll, I'll go into the details of how we are managing it. But uh, I'll start with the individual thread block. The blue box that you see is the, uh, the thread itself, which has a polling loop in it. Uh, and I'll give a few more details on how we set up the polling thread in the next slide. Uh, but the yellow box that you're seeing is the interface that allows you to add or delete socket FTs out of um, uh, socket or pipe FTs in, out of the polling loop. Uh, the polling thread utility, which is at the very top, the block at the very top, is what manages our global data structures and makes sure all the counters are up to date. Inside an individual thread, we have uh, a polling loop. But while we set up the thread, we also have two administrative pipes that we set up. Uh, one is for adding or deleting FDs, which the net services callbacks use. Uh, it, is a, it is a control pipe, and the interface is provided by the thread manager. Uh, the second is when we want to send a, an open flow packet out onto the wire, uh, the API directly would, uh, can send that packet into this pulling loop, and uh, it will get processed to be pushed out on the wire, which I'll get to in a bit. So that's the second pipe we have. Um, the next is for every FD, uh, we need to register a pull in and a pull out callback function. And that's done by the net services uh, callbacks, which is the point number three that we had to introduce whenever you introduce a new layer for protocol is uh, define these two callbacks, the pull in and pull out callbacks. Um, next up, I'll show you how a packet is sent out. So when a packet, open flow packet arrives at the polling loop, um, it's a polling that occurs on the FT, the pipe FT. And at that point, we put that packet into a hash table. And uh, we set the pull out flag on the corresponding outgoing socket FT. And then the next thing that happens is the pull out event occurs. And the packet is pulled out of the hash table, pushed out on the wire, and the pull-out flag is reset. That's essentially the way the packet is sent out. Uh, the in path is actually very simple. The pull-in pull -in flags are always set uh, for all FTs. And an event occurs, and the net services pull-in callbacks kick in, and it, it's directly sent out to the API out onto the uh, controller or the switch. Onto the pool, at some point we would have we would end up with a bunch of pool, a bunch of threads with different capacities of sockets that it can take on, right? Some holes in every thread. So the way we organize it is have a decreasing, uh, which is I think the next slide has some more information. So we have a global list of all the threads with uh, uh, sorted by decreasing number of available sockets. So the, if we have one thread with five sockets available up to capacity and another with three, the first one will be five, next will be three, and the others will be filled to capacity. We do that, and then anytime we want to add a, an FT to, us, um, to a polling loop, we need to find a specific thread that can accept it, so the best thread that can take it. And uh, the find or create function is what gives us, it iterates to the last thread with availability and gets us to the thread that can accept the new FT. These are the two add and delete functions. The first one, um, the first one does exactly that. It uh, finds the best thread to add the socket FD using the function that I just spoke of. And the second one is a delete, which deletes the socket from the thread. Now we have a hole in that thread, as in we have capacity in that thread, and the uh, list is again resorted. These are the pull-in and pull-out logs. 
I think I'll start by showing you the FTs that are being pulled. FT8 is the uh, control pipe, FT10 is the data pipe, 31, 32 are two sockets being pulled on. We get a pull in on FT32, this is the incoming uh, path of the packet. A packet is received, and then which, which as you have seen earlier too, we uh, trigger the callback from the controller. The pull out, we have two polling events. First is the pull in that happens on FT10, which is the uh, data pipe. So the packet arrives, put it in the hash table, set the pull out flag, and the next thing that happens is pull out on the uh, outgoing FT. We're sending a packet out and resetting the pull out, pull out flag. Unit test automation, we have used glib uh, very heavily for unit test automation. It has a great framework for it. We have two ways to run our tests, um, either through make or through gtester once it's compiled. Uh, this is, we focused most of our coverage on the infrastructure itself. So we started with the pull thread, we got it fully tested, uh, then, we start, then we went on to the utilities which exercise some of the elastic pool. But bear in mind that we have not yet scaled our, um, we're still in development, we have not yet scaled all to 256K, but we have still tested that infrastructure for one, a few sessions. We've also covered some net services as part of our tests. Now, this is the full list of unit tests that we have, the results that, that, uh, that are put up here. Uh, TC3, for example, just tests the poll-in callback function and, uh, on the pull thread, and util TC2 is, does more of an end-to-end -end for a single session by using the controller's uh, port itself. Uh, integrating our uh, library with an existing controller was an in interesting challenge. So there are some very simple steps to follow if you would like to integrate our library with, with a controller. These are the basic three steps here. The controller has to implement you know, the call, the, these basic three callbacks. And once that is done, it has to initialize and register itself with the library. It also has to take care of you know, the freeing part of the library to free all the resources which it has used. Uh, we have come up with a basic SDN setup in order to test our library. And this, this, this picture here uh, represents the whole setup we have used for testing. We have integrated our OpenFlow driver with an existing Mule controller, which is an open source controller written in C. And uh, we have uh, deployed Mininet, uh, which is a framework for testing SDN. And in Mininet, uh, the OpenFlow vSwitch is, is an in integrated part of Mininet. So we have deployed Mininet uh, using a minimal topology. So we have a single switch and two hosts associated with that switch. As you can see here, we've specified that the controller is remote here. So the OpenFlow switch on Mininet will try and connect to the remote controller, which is our Mule controller, with the OS Connect library integrated as part of it. So this is our whole test setup and we've, uh, we've, we've, bring, we've, we've brought this up and uh, we kind of tested how the flows are exchanged back and forth between the switch and the controller uh, as part of this. This is a small snapshot of our uh, Wireshark capture. So once we bring up this whole test setup, and uh, the, open, uh, the Mule controller, which has our OpenFlow library integrated in it, it begins to exchange the OpenFlow messages with the uh, OVS switch. As you can see here, there are some hello messages that are uh, sent in, in the process of initiation of the OpenFlow channels, followed by the OpenFlow features request and feature reply. This is where the DPID and AUX ID are exchanged and the protocol actually determine, the, the two ends actually determine the version of the protocol to be used, which is negotiated using these messages. And we also have the echo request and reply messages. These are kind of heartbeat messages between the switch and the controller to make sure that the channel, OpenFlow channels are up and running between them. So that was our design and um, some information on what we do and how we do it. 
what's next? Um, we hear a, a few tracks that we have thought of, but we are open to more ideas. Uh, there are some very obvious gaps we need to fill in, TLS, uh, IPv6, uh, the, uh, that's the more obvious thing. The greater OF awareness is really where we want to draw the boundary of how much o open flow channel work that the library will absorb. And uh, there is a lot of scope there right now. Scaling to 256K, we have designed for it. Uh, we have not yet tested it. So we are, um, I'm sure we'll find some interesting problems along the way. So that's very exciting. Personally, I, for me, the last one, the benchmarking, uh, because we have put a lot into making this design, put a lot of thought into making design of, um, extensible to make it very um, STN specific and so on. And uh, this is where the rubber meets the road. So I'm, I'm very curious to find out, actually benchmark it and see how it performs against other um, more well-known um, implementations. So to summarize, we have uh, very simple in that our API is a small set. Uh, it's easy to extend. It's easy to integrate. We've shown you the steps. It's literally one, two, three. Uh, it's powerful because we think the thread library, uh, the thread model that we've used is pretty unique. We haven't seen it uh, being implemented in too many other places. In fact, I don't remember seeing that any other place. So we think this is more suited to SDN, and um, uh, that's where the power of this library is. It is true open flow. We'll, we'll be implementing the open flow headers as it is defined in the spec. Um, easy to integrate, goes with simple, and uh, it's a very well-known um, open source uh, license that it is published on. So what, what the motivations were for us to launch this project and get started on it was to actually be able to learn STN using the building blocks that we understand best, which is network plumbing. So we started with the very simple, very well-known, um, the socket kind of connection uh, built on top of it, uh, got SDN actually working on top of it, and now we have, we're actually playing with the SDN setup where we have our own code integrated into it, which is quite a thrill for us. And I think that is a very powerful way of uh, learning a new technology, and it has helped uh, the, the core team, uh, the five of us who started this to um, to really get in, get in uh, knee deep with STN and enjoy it. Uh, so if anybody else also shares that and wants to contribute or um, give ideas or anything, we have a whole bunch of information up on our GitHub wiki. Uh, we have two repos, one for the uh, OF Connect library itself, and the second repo is that of the integrated Mool controller, which is also open sourced. And um, uh, feel free to email us, drop a line at um, uh, organizers at coachix.org, and uh, we'll be very happy to have you join our team. This is the team that uh, made it possible. We are toasting to our first uh, completion of the project. On your rightmost is Rupa Desher, who is the founder of uh, Coachix. Uh, next is Swapna Ayer and um, Kajal Bhargava, who work at Cisco, and then Ms. Ramya working at VMware, and I work at Ericsson. So we all came together. Our companies agreed to donate the code to Codechecks, and uh, this is what we have at the end of it. So <laughs> Do we have time for a demo? 15 more minutes. Okay. So we, we have a quick demo that we could show you before taking some questions. It should take a couple of minutes. So um, we'll be giving a very short demo on what we have done so far. So uh, basically, I've set up Wireshark so that it can capture packets on the loopback interface. Currently, we are running the switch and the controller on the same host, but they can be run remotely. So this is the Mule controller, which has uh, our uh, library integrated in it. So I'm going to run the controller now. As you can see, it is uh, start. It is waiting for new, waiting to accept new connections from any switches. 
And next I'll start uh, Mininet. So uh, we're having a minimal topology deployed in Mininet with one switch and two hosts. So you can see that there is a single switch connected to two hosts here. And let's look at the Wireshark captures now. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, basically we have our controller running on uh, the local host and port six six three three, and you can see that they're continuously exchanging OpenFlow messages now. So the OpenFlow hello messages uh, is what will initiate the OpenFlow connection, followed by let me just stop the capture for a bit. Yeah, the, the OpenFlow features request and replies where they negotiate which version of the protocol both of them should be running. And they also exchange the DPID and aux ID of the main channel at this point. So the, the main OpenFlow channel is fully established. And you can see that uh, they also have these heartbeat messages, uh, echo request and echo reply messages being constantly exchanged between them. Uh, to, for, in order to check the health of the open flow channels. So that's where we are today, but we plan to add uh, support for more protocols like TLS and IPv6 soon. And we also plan to profile and benchmark our library with some other libraries out there. Thank you. Thank you. That looks really interesting. Um, can you talk a little bit about what happens if one of the callback functions blocks for some reason and doesn't return immediately? Um, how does the library handle that, or what will be the effects of that? Do you mean the socket calls blocking? Um, not so much the socket calls down into the Linux side, but the callback into the application to say we've received a packet, for instance, if it doesn't sort of just put the packet in a buffer, but instead does something that takes a long time. Uh, the packet that has to go up to the controller. Um, we would basically have to debug it, I guess. But so we don't have any handling to specifically take care of, you know, time it and see if it's still hanging on or doing any exception handling. So far what we have developed is basically for the good case. So I think that's what we have to start looking at at the uh, negative cases. And that, that's a very good, thanks for the idea. I think we'll mm. look into it. It's an issue I found with the Ryu handling, which also uses a similar event model, is if your okay. event thread blocks for some reason, then a whole lot of things can end up being hung up in that. Right, because your open flow messages are not going back and forth. Okay, great. Thank you. Have you, have you thought at all um, about ways to make this resilient or um, um, highly available? So, so you've talked a little bit about scaling and how you can support a lot of switches. One, um, one outstanding issue for a lot of controllers is how you actually take the controller framework and make it so that it's um, highly, highly available. Have you um, thought at all about how your library might um, help enable that? The high availability of the controller. Um, we have had some early discussions on it, but um, yeah, these are I think these are some great ideas. We should follow up, and we should probably have a discussion with you after this to to get more ideas on it. So, yeah. 
Uh, as to, if I wanted to play with this, um, you know, have you got a? Um, I haven't looked at your wiki. Does it um, give a? Um, uh, does it? Does it tell me how I can uh, get started with playing with it? Yes, absolutely. We have actually a lot of instructions, but also the. Uh, on how, on how to use GitHub workflow that we have, uh, we recommend, and the repository is also online. So, uh, are you online? Maybe we could show that. You want to remove this one right now? Okay. Maybe I think it's on my laptop. One second, I'll quickly show you the. Uh, and this is the big, yeah, this is what we have. Yeah. Right, so we have uh, information on the sources, the, um, how to install it, how to compile it, our workflow, um, how to commit a patch, our test setup on how to bring up your, um, can you hear me? Oops. Oh, sorry. So this is the test setup where you can, um, some instructions on how to get started testing with our uh, Mool controller. Um, even before you, so we have a lot of instruction online which you could use to get started. Uh, my question is relating to the number of threads you got, and particularly Python. The, the, your heavy emphasis on threads and implies to me that there's a lot of uh, CPU activity you expect going on on each thread. Otherwise, you wouldn't bother. But Python doesn't support threads very well. Does it? Um, how does this interact with your model? So, uh, could you repeat the very last question you had asked? Okay, I, um, I got that Python doesn't. Yeah, the threading is, is a bit. You of have a, you have a lot of threads there. Right. Um, the impression I got that the CPU would be used by the callbacks from your threads. So. Um, <laughs> But Python doesn't support multi-threaded callbacks very well at all, in fact, at all. It okay. has this global interpreter lock. Uh, I was just wondering, does this mean in general for Python usage it devolves down to one thread? So we have Python bindings. So we are, are you know, what we are proposing is to have this library work as a, you know, keep it in C and then have a Python binding that exposes just the API. Uh, as a pluggable module to Python. So we, we want, what's that, did you have a point? So we basically want to um, exploit the threading capabilities of uh, C. Um, that's, I think, one of the reasons that we even use the programming language. Thank you. One more question. Yeah, I was actually quite, um, I was actually quite happy to see that it was written in C and add the other ones as bindings because what what I found in doing a lot of the stuff in Python, particularly with um, Aru, is that um, you very quickly run out of steam the more open flow flow operations per second that you do. So I mean, having it having it in C and being able to use threading in C would, would be you know a big advantage. advantage. So yeah, Thank you. well done. Thanks. Thank you. I have a couple of quick questions. So um, while you were talking about a scaling test, just wanted to know how your test setup was like. How, how were you testing that scalability? The scaling? Um, I think initially we'll want to use as much virtual environments as possible. Once we, are, you know, once we get the basic bugs out, then we want to be able to uh, try out something, essentially have a controller in a different host, have the network of switches in a, a different and you know, exercise that a little more. 
but I think we'll, we'll take baby steps. We'll start with, you know, the least we can set up so we can get through our first set of bugs and then and just go through that. Okay. Yeah. Um, another quick question. So while you were describing about your elastic pool, right. so you mentioned the blocks. What, what did each of those blocks mean? Is it a single connection between the controller and the switch? Or the, what each of the, the blocks in the pool itself? They, yeah. uh, they are thread, um, let me get to it here. The individual blocks, right? So they are one unit that manage one thread. So the blue box is the thread itself, but then the rest of the code is running in the... Uh, context of the main library thread, right? So we have individual threads for uh, for each of the socket handling. We have, a, we have like a pool of threads, but then the library itself runs in the context of the controller. So th that's where the thread manager and the pool thread utility are existing. But we need all of, all of this functioning to get one block of pool thread working. I know you didn't do any uh, uh, performance measurements yet, any metrics, Not yet. Uh, but what are, what are your anticipation, what are your expectations for performance levels in uh, bandwidth um, or packets per second or whatever? Well, I think we should, we want to start with, uh, I don't have numbers at this moment, but I think we want to start with what's already benchmarked for floodlight and other controllers. I think there's a lot of numbers that are already published. And uh, our first step would be to get there and, you know, see how we can exploit our own um, design for that. But, sorry, I don't have the numbers right now. Thanks. I have time for some more questions, if anyone has questions. So I'll repeat the question. Uh, the question is about um, integrating the open f uh, the OF connect with the switch side. Uh, we have mostly talked about the controller. That is true. Uh, the API and all of the design is geared to that. Uh, in fact, there is some API, the create channel that only the switch can really use because we are not expecting the controller to start a channel. So we have designed for it, but uh, that's again a test effort that has to uh, that has to you know be planned uh, coming forward going forward um, just to point out that you know we are volunteering engineers and that's we do this on a spare time so we do the best we can do it uh, given the resources we have so the, there is a lot of work to be done we admit but I think we are very proud of where we even got it to uh, and that it has some good foundation to start off on Sorry, there was another question, I think. Oh, thank you. Do you require contributors to sign a contributor license agreement? Uh, so right now what we have encountered is we are all employed and we need our employment to release, um, you know, this, uh, intellectual property rights to your contribution. So there will be some, some uh, level of that depending on what, what kind of, uh, you know, day job you may have or if you're self-employed or other things. So there will be some kind of, um, but it will go through code checks. So once you contact the organizers, I think we should be able to put it together. I was wondering about your motivations for doing this work. It's, um, you know, there's, uh, there are some other um, projects that uh, uh, there are other controllers, and you know what uh, what motivated you? Uh, was it deficiencies in others, or uh, an eagerness to um, explore this area? You know, like a a creative um, a desire to be creative there. Um, I, I think it started with the latter. Uh, to explore SDN and to learn as much as we can, but uh, from the perspective that we understand. 
Um, and as we were designing, we were constantly thinking of how we can how we can make ours different and what the technologies out there are. So uh, that was part of the process, certainly. But our initial motivation was to just learn SD and just you know be students and put together something from scratch, uh, make it work, and uh, see how far it goes. I think that's where it started. So that has been quite a ride. Thanks. We have time for one more question. Okay, um, please thank our presenters.